guys. I'm Francis Schwepp. Um, nice to meet you all. Um, happy to be hosting today uh, along with Mike. Um, just to quickly set the stage, I'm a partner at Two Sigma Ventures. Um, we're an early stage venture capital fund, uh, invest seed through Series B uh, across all the different types of verticals um, based in New York and San Francisco. Um, and most importantly, I'm thrilled to introduce you all to Mike Friedman, who is a co-founder and CTO of Timescale. He's also, I don't know if he has time for it, but he's a professor of computer science at Princeton University. Um, we had the privilege of getting to know Mike and his co-founder, AJ, back in uh, 2015 as they were starting the company um, and also were able to invest in, in their Series A and in, in future rounds. Um, so I'll let him tell the story, but I just want to say thanks, Mike, for, for doing this with me today. Um, you know, we feel privileged to be supporting you guys on this journey. Um, well, thank so you for having me. Why don't... Yeah, awesome. Well, let's, let's jump in. Um, you know, I know this is a, this discussion of kind of product development in the age of cloud. So we'll talk a lot about that in company building um, and in a little bit also on AI, given the summit is, uh, you know, um, related to a, a artificial intelligence. But just to set the stage, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, what is Timescale and sort of what is the mission of the company? Sure. Uh, Timescale is a Either we're a database company who has a cloud product, or now we think of us ourselves more as a cloud company who has a database product. Um, but we, we let, alternatively, the way to think about it is we basically uh, supercharge Postgres for modern developers. We initially started working with a lot of time series and event data. Obviously, a lot of that type of data has scale. Uh, so you have to actually think about how do I build a very robust database that could handle the scale that modern applications needs. Um, but increasingly, we, we, what we see is that if you look at effectively anybody's database, as, as, as it starts to get large, you know, hundreds of gigabytes, what you ultimately see is a lot of what they're storing is types of data that really need the type of technologies that we've, we've developed. So even if you think about your e-commerce applications, the thing that takes a lot of storage is storing every order that you have. If you think about logistics, the fact that you're... Uh, keeping track of where each item you have is going around the world. Those are all forms of this uh, event data or time series data that ultimately benefit from um, the uh, technology that we have, which really supercharges in terms of both uh, performance and uh, and and price. Um, but uh, when we talk about the mission, I mean, while we're a company that ultimately builds a database, what we really think that we do is we help developers build the next wave of computing. And if you think about the transition from, uh, you know, what people say software is eating in the world, and some people might say data is eating software or something like that, I think the really exciting thing about being a, a software engineering now and working in tech in general is how that these technologies really transform different industries. And so if it's, and really, you know, all kind of great pieces of software are almost every great piece of software at some point is built on top of a, a database as one of its key infrastructure points. And so we like to think that we're behind all of these amazing innovations that are happening across a whole host of industries. Yeah, awesome. I mean, uh, one thing that um, I often talk about when, I, when I'm, I'm trying to explain to people just like the importance of time series data is like, do you want to watch, uh, do you want to snapshot like a photo of something or do you want to see the movie over time and sort of watch the movie of how things are changing and unfolding in your business? And so um, it's exciting that, you know, time scale uh, enables that. Um, so great. Okay. And then I'm going to almost do this AI hot take up front because I think sure. that we have even more to talk about from the company building um, perspective, um, especially this is something that's on top of everyone's minds today. Um, and, you know, I think uh, it's very relevant as we think about time series data, too, because a lot of it, you know, in terms of predictions around uh, in, in uh, machine learning and, and LLMs, um, you need historical data in order to predict the future. So. How how is time scale or even you you know kind of thinking about AI, um, and in the context of uh, sort of the future of databases, like anything that you are thinking about in terms of your product development to sort of adjust to this new world? Yeah, so there's there's two parts to this. One is you know how do we think and how are people already using uh, time scale for their type of AI applications? Then also how are we thinking about in ourselves you know using or leveraging AI and 
LLMs and everything as part of our product experience. And, and I could talk, you know, very briefly about both of those. I mean, I think the big question people go down whenever, you know, you have these big interests in in kind of new domains, what inevitably happens is people start building a lot of custom kind of bespoke infrastructure for that domain. And, you know, I think what you generally see is sometimes that those needs are sufficiently differentiated so that those really persist as like a standalone category of underlying, you know, data infrastructure. And a lot of times you kind of see that, in fact, um, you know, the existing things we had could be uh, evolved and improved uh, to now um, have those as well. And this is also like an operational question, which is like, you know, do you want to build your infrastructure on one or two core databases or core pieces of technology? Or when you deploy an application, do you want to have five or 10 different databases and, and whatever that you need to keep running to power this one application? And, and I think it's also not the same across the entire industry. Like, you know, if you're operating, let's say, at Google scale, uh, you know, you often have to build bespoke infrastructure because the needs of that scale are just so wildly different from, you know, 99.99% of the industry. And so I think, you know, right now, for example, there's a lot of interest in um, uh, vector databases as, as one example. Uh, vector databases are one of the places where you store um, memory uh, for, for LLMs, or uh, in some case, you take these like standard foundational models, maybe from OpenAI. You know, we, for example, just uh, as a demo, built a, a chatbot. I, I know the last speaker was talking about chatbots. Uh, we built a chatbot internally that's trained against all of uh, Timescale's documentation, right? And so the way you do that is you take the foundational model from like uh, uh, GPT, and then you put on top of that our own content, which then becomes the preferred content. And then when you do a, a when you chat with it, it is based underneath on this foundational model, but then it uses a vector database, which in this case is time scale, serving as a vector database for that specialized content that sits on top of it. So I think you're going to see these type of applications. Um, you know, I imagine for sometimes, you know, a bunch of developers are going to explore both. You know, some people will go for the latest shiny. Some people, frankly, are also are building more production applications. Uh, will recognize the the old statement is it takes at least 10 years to build a robust database. The key part of your database is you almost don't want to think about your database. You just want the database to run. And in some sense, that's what, especially because timescale is built and extends Postgres, it has you know 20 or 30 years of reliability under its belt and now supercharged for these new use cases. So we're very excited about it. I think that what we see is the use cases here are still on the early side that we um, people are experimenting. There's a lot of you know pre-Cambrian excitement around this, um, but I think it has less been where things are really running into production, where you actually just want this thing to be reliable and run. And I, and I think that's when you'll start seeing more of the industry uh, turn back to say, what are the core technologies that I really trust to run my application that I want to be customer focused, that I want to be running 24/7, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, at the very least, I think, you know, you can't afford not to be thinking about how you're going to leverage, um, whether it's, you know, for your own operational um, efficiencies, AI, or something you might expose to your end customers as you're starting a business today. Um, but agree, it's still early days. Um, and when you were starting Timescale, it was pre the uh, pre GPT um, and the sort of widely accessible LLM libraries. So maybe just Bring us back to that point in time, um, in 2015, when you and AJ sure. were were about starting this business. What what were you seeing, and what uh, sort of led you to the decision to drop what you were doing and, and start the business? Yeah, so at the time we were actually um, mid 2000, 2000, the 2010s, where there's a lot of actually increased focus on IoT. And that's when we started seeing more and more hardware starting to come out, connected hardware, which were, it hasn't slowed down. It's just become more normalized at this point. Um, and we initially, when we ultimately built Timescale, our, our first thing was not actually to build uh, this database, uh, but was actually to build an IoT data platform, but made for people building applications, not just doing data science. I, I, I often think about the difference between people doing kind of data science and reporting and, and, and research. That's what a lot of the traditional AI models were done. They were done by data scientists and ML researchers, where now we're actually uh, serving developers and, and operationalizing those things so they could actually you know, 
applications that people could interact with. At that time, again, IoT was hot. We were thinking about what does the data platform look for that. Um, and we weren't happy with any of the uh, time series databases in the market. Um, we, in fact, using another one that was open source. It wasn't reliable enough. Remember those 10, 10 years. It wasn't fast enough. It it didn't really support SQL. And you know, we kept having this data where it's like, well, we have our metrics data, but then we also have metadata around it, which, by the way, we're also mm -hmm. seeing in, in LLMs now, which is an interesting thing. And it was really useful to be able to join that data, to like be able to unlock, to enrich your clear metrics with the business information around it. And so ultimately, we decided, like, well, none of these things on the market support this. We think we knew how we knew how to re-architect Postgres to enable these type of use cases. And the minute we uh, uh, open sourced it, like, the amount of interest uh, in that first month was probably greater than we saw in the previous year, year and a half on the on the IoT platform. And it was pretty clear what the direction forward was. Okay, you're prompting two follow up questions. Is one. Sure. Um, open source, and then I have another one around sort of use cases beyond IoT. But to start with the open source, you guys, you know, you were open source from day one. Um, maybe talk a bit about your go-to-market decision there um, and why you decided to build time, uh, time scale um, from an open source perspective, sort of what the things you saw then, and maybe we can get into a little bit some of the uh, advantages and disadvantages to, to starting this way. Yeah, so, I mean, I think... Um... I think you'd be hard pressed to look back and see a key piece of data infrastructure built over the last 20 years that developers rely on that's not open source. Um, I think it has almost become a, a requirement in terms of the level of, of, of trust, you know, people could have eyes on what it's actually doing. If you run into an issue, it does help to be able to have source available for people to look at. Um, and I think there are, if you want to broadly serve developers around the world, you have to recognize that they're going to want to deploy you in lots of different things. Um, even our, we could talk about our go-to-market is purely cloud. We have people running timescale on little IoT devices that are running in mines. And so like the reason they don't use the cloud is they actually don't have connectivity to the cloud, let's say. And I think it's, it's useful to have um, this broad base that could be applied to many different types of applications. Um, and it, it was really just a given to us that we think that modern software development is, you know, happens on GitHub. Uh, developers want to be able to see access to what, you know, what it is. Um, and there's a lot of advantage, advantages to that. Now on the go to market side, the interesting thing, if, if that's the next, next question is we, unlike a lot of open source companies, um, we only our go-to-market is only the cloud. So, you know, there's a couple different business models when it comes to uh, open source. Uh, you know, the three main ones are basically you could offer support, you could uh, have an open core where part of it's open source and part of it is closed source that you charge for enterprise, or you can, or you could have a managed service. I think the industry has moved over the time, but. In general, I think it's much more exciting to offer a, a cloud service because in the end, I think we we could really control the experience we give developers. And I think if you just think about the expectations people have over time is like, it's the same with even the design aesthetic about UI UX, like the, 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 the quality that people expect, even developers expect from our software is actually really high right now. And the great thing about doing this through cloud environment is, um, it allows you to control the uh, infrastructure in which you run. And so you could actually make more opinionated decisions about uh, how this gets deployed and used, what things should be baked inside the actual database software itself, what thing is part of a broader cloud platform that you provide. Uh, you take away all the costs of operations and stuff. And so you could think more that in product, there's this notion of a job to be done. You know, What is somebody hiring you to do? And for a database, like we like to say, people are really hiring the database to be, you know, easy, fast, scalable, worry-free, and cost-effective. And people don't want to think about backups or HA. They want to make sure that their database never goes down and is always available. And so it's just much easier to deliver on really what job you're being hired to do when you actually could offer a, a fully managed cloud environment. 
Yeah. And before even, because I know you guys made that shift to cloud, which is a pretty big pivot um, to make as a company, especially if you've been doing a lot of like on-prem um, deployments. Um, just going back to the open source, I do think there are a lot of companies that are making this decision today and trying to figure out what to open source, um, what like part of the code base to open source and how to kind of build monetization strategies from that, maybe what features to withhold as part of the open source so that they can charge for them. Um, how did you guys think about that strategy um, for Timescale? Yeah, so we uh, we actually, uh, I think I think two things really to talk about. One is actually a licensing in general. You know, when we initially launched, um, we used the Apache 2 license, which probably a lot of the audience knows, classic open source license. Um, one thing that we saw, and this is the same time, um, you know, a number of other companies were facing this as well. I think kind of Mongo, uh, Elastic, Confluent, um, you know, they're in general, we're not obviously, lots of other people have noticed this move to the cloud. And in that case, like the common thing that developers want is they just want this service to to run. And so um, the challenge that I think uh, software companies, soft startups have is then what that really means is that you ultimately do uh, compete with the hyperscale cloud vendors in providing a managed service. And I think many startups themselves or many companies can provide a better product experience over you know, your own software than somebody like Amazon uh, or, or Google or Azure would. Um, but because they own so much of the path, they own distribution, they own pricing, they own lots of things that they could leverage from a business perspective, not just from a product perspective, that actually puts uh, other companies who need to be deployed in the cloud because that's where your customers consume data uh, at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the way we thought about it is, um, so we basically introduced what we call the time scale license. And it's similar to some other ones, I think, although better in some ways and, and probably really innovated uh, in this space. Um, and the key part of it is that, uh, it's all on GitHub. It's all open. People could run it. People could use it commercially. The effectively only thing that other companies can't do with our code is offer basically time scales of service. And so what that allows us to do is then not have to hold features out from the community. Our entire database is all, we've never relicensed our existing code base, but all the new advanced features were all under release. This, they're all on GitHub. They're all together. All of our engineers could work on one kind of sol single code base. We don't port things back and forth. Um, but yet it basically means that we could continue to make investments on this benefit, both our community, but then not have to worry about at the exact same time, you know, Amazon, Azure, Google are basically taking all that work and just offering it through, through RDS, through Azure Postgres and other things. Yeah. And it's key to, you know, how do you build a team towards that? Because I think a lot of like even providing the managed service uh, has real implications for, you know, what your North Star as a company is and sure. how you're actually building the team to that North Star. Yeah. So one of the interesting things is really this leads to actually, I mean, when we started, we we're building a database. That means we're building software. We have quarterly, roughly quarterly release cycles. And ultimately, when you build a, a, a cloud, you know, we actually hired a completely new engineering team. Uh, Mm -hmm. focused on a lot of different things. But I think what was interesting to us about was how different even culturally both the product engineering was as well as the full go-to-market motion when you fully embrace the cloud. You know, you think about a product engineering developers, you think about product managers who think more SaaS-like, work really closely with developers, seeing what they do as opposed to software where like if you're lucky, you hear, you hear randomly what customers tell you. You don't actually have data. You don't actually feel the pain and feel the empathy from your users. You have engineers who both release at a much faster rate, but also are responsible for operations. And so it just changes the whole dynamic. And you have a goal to market where we're, even though we're a database, we're very much a self, completely self-serve from the beginning, a product-led, we like to call it product-led go to market, not product-led growth per se. But what that means is a traditional enterprise sales for database, you might spend months doing the sales and then you're going to do a multi-year contract where if you move to the cloud, you have sign up for a trial or, or free and it's immediately you're kind of off to the races. So it's just a very yeah. different motion and that impacts marketing, sales, product, engineering, support, technical services. And it really reorients the whole company. I think that was the, 
our observation, we had to reorient the whole company to be a type of cloud only really mm. SaaS like company as opposed to a traditional enterprise software company. Yeah, I think you said this, but you know, it's like used to be the database company with a cloud product. Now you're a cloud company with a database product. And that has implications not only from the software architecture itself, but the architecture of the, the team. Um, yep. And you guys have done a, an incredible job, you know, shifting to this new world. Um, I know only have a few minutes left. I think just for the founders on the call, um, like what are you kind of looking back, wish you could have told yourself uh, back in the 2010s as you were starting this journey, knowing what you know now? Um, maybe what would you have done differently? Or um, if not that, if you have no regrets, <laughs> yeah. what, um, what kind of words of inspiration do you have for founders starting off today? Yeah, so I think, you know, we we think sometimes of you know, our internal, we like to call them operating principles as opposed to to values. And one of the operating, kind of both, but one of the operating principles we talk about is, is to narrow the focus and to uh, kind of zoom in. And I think this is, I remember I, I talked about this journey from kind of being on-prem or building a software to cloud. And I remember we talked to some founders in the beginning, they're like, it's going to be hard doing both. And a lot of big, if you actually look at most database companies and data infrastructure co companies, they actually do do both, but that's partially due to legacy reasons. They started on premise and they moved to cloud and it becomes just very difficult because you're really managing two completely different, both product offerings as well as go to market uh, and, and uh, go to market processes. And um, in the beginning, like, well, we, we think we could try it. And sure enough, we should have listened to their advice and really even uh, I, I think we like to make big, make big bets. And looking back, I think we could have made those big bets six months, a year, even earlier than we did. So I, I think having that early courage of convictions and knowing that the superpower of being a startup is being able to narrow the focus. Your goal isn't to win the whole market. Your goal is to win a much smaller portion of the market, but but have passionate, engaged users in it. Um, and to use that focus and your nimbleness to your advantage compared to much bigger companies that you're competing with. Totally. Yeah. And it's incredible because you, I mean, you kind of started with a focus on IoT where you had sensors that were collecting timestamp data. But um, now it seems obvious that every company has a longitudinal view of its data, but that expanded obviously into additional categories as well um, logistics and manufacturing to finance to Web3 and crypto. Crypto collecting data over time, but I have. I know um, we talked. We talked about two sigma. You know, they said like probably ninety percent right. of two sigma's data is time series. Yeah, one hundred percent. So you know, finance is interesting because it's kind of one of the first areas where you had yep. such a, a large um, a swath of like historical longitudinal timestamp data that was well structured. You could start making like real decisions with it. Yep. Um, hence, you know. Uh, 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 <laughs> systematic hedge funds. Um, I have a couple questions, so I'm going to ask one of them at least. Um, aside from speed and cost, this is Taylor's question, what can be done with the timescale infrastructure that could not be done with other means? I guess he's getting at uh, differentiators um, from the timescales product. Yeah, so I think that, I mean, I think um, going back to that, uh, those things, it, it, you know, it, it's hard to summarize sometimes benefits. I could either talk extremely technical or in more uh, kind of emotional values. But I, I think that, you know, the big win that we see people have databases are, um, you know, uh, price and performance is a huge thing. Um, and I think that really leads to, and the other part of it is really the ease of use. I mean, the, the core attribute when you're a developer, you you know, while we and I'm sure lots of people like to nerd out about the, you know, internals of opt ways that you've done different data structures or optimizations, uh, in the end, your your goal is to build the you know best, most solid thing on top of it, best applications. And so a lot of our focus has just been how to really focus on those developer ergonomics and developer experience that you couldn't have, that you don't get in a traditional database. Again, once you start you know, things always look easy. And once you start working at, with larger data sets, that's when things always start breaking. Um, we're about to announce the next couple, the next month or two, some really other interesting things where we're taking that a step further, kind of going to this level of of um, kind of elasticity where users 
don't really need to. We used to have this trade off between you either had kind of serverless, which meant like it was flexible, but it was relatively low scale. It was cost efficient at low scale, but got really expensive at high scale or dedicated, which was inflexible and static. And you had to make a lot of upfront decisions. And if you under over provisioned, you were out of luck. And we've really spent the last year trying to think about how do we make infrastructure that bridges these two things? How do we take away those provisioning decisions that people make? You know, how to allow them to also you know, prevent runaway mistakes or, or, or things which all of a sudden sees usage spike up and costs get out of control. So we've thought a lot about what it really means to operate data infrastructure and to allow developers to really just focus on their applications. Great. Um, and then I have another one from Muhammad, if we have time for it. Um, might be the last one. He asks, can you share product team structure and how the product decisions are made? I think this is a key one because again, yeah. like, you got to structure your people to, to build the right products uh, and build the processes around that. Yeah. And I think this always just changes as the evolution of the company. The thing that you had you know, at 10 people, at 50 people, at 200 people differ. Um, and so obviously we've evolved that as we've we've grown um, you know, one of the things that we like to do is 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 make sure that different engineering teams have strong ownership over the infrastructure that they do. Uh, we also like to ensure that um, um, you know there's typically uh, one PM that's uh, primarily working with each engineering team to avoid any uh, to make sure that there's a clear uh, roadmap and 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 backlog. Um, the interesting thing about building data infrastructure is, you know, unlike some SaaS applications, there are certain things we could execute really quickly, but there are other initiatives which take months and quarters to implement because, you know, in the end, we're sometimes dealing with very technical, uh, deep work at the same time of actually operating a production platform with, you know, um, you know, many, many, many thousands of production databases running on it. Um uh, I think that we also, one of the things that we do, uh, you know, we move because of as your company's grown, we move from more sprint level things of of operating at two to four weeks to quarterly planning because as you evolve, you need to align more. Um, you have to align your go to market motions more around kind of what your uh, what your product roadmap looks like. And so that requires a little bit more more work there. Um, and we the other thing that we do, also is be really explicit about the timeline. And by the timeline, that is, uh, what are the features that we're doing that are actually meant for the go-to-market teams to worry about now? What are the features when we launch will directly be useful for current customers, for future customers? What are the product bets we're, we're making that are operating on the future time, on the in the next six to 12 months? Which is like these are things that we're not completely sure how the market yet is going to adopt them, how to position them, and what are the even the longer term bets. And I think it's been really important for us when we think about our product roadmap and any with the teams to work on for everybody, including the go to market teams, to really know when we're developing capabilities, what timelines they're operating on, so they could focus really on selling what the, what we have today and really communicating what we have today, while allows different parts of the organization to think about a l little longer timeline. Totally. Yeah. And the, the timelines you're operating on obviously changes with the stage of the business. So often as and a the type early of stage the, company. And the type of the technology. Yeah. Absolutely. Right, 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 right. Yeah. I was going to say like, you're starting off, you're thinking week to week or day to day, you know, <laughs> you're living day to day and then you can start, you know, I think living a bit more quarter to quarter and, you know, starting to invest in those longer term bets as you grow. Um, Mike, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a privilege partnering with you and time scale on this journey. Um, and we're really excited about what the next five years hold. So um, stay tuned, everyone on the call uh, and use time scale. <laughs> Thank you so much.